Oh no, you did it! I gotta get the squad back together. You busy? Jim, we need you. My shift's about to start. It's Sunday. Mom! Now? We need you. Fine. Mary, you're coming with us. All right, who's ready? Squad goals, folks! All right! Well, what's up, everybody? My name is Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. And I want to, let's actually take a moment to welcome our campuses watching throughout the state of New Jersey. What's up, guys? So happy you all are with us. And we are starting a brand new series, Squad Goals, where we're going to be looking at the question, who's in your squad? Who are the men and women that are in your life to help you make you a better person? Uh, is it family? Is it friends? Is it coworkers? Who's in your squad? And maybe you've been living under a rock for the past couple of years. You're like, dude, what are you talking about? What is a squad goal? Like, I don't even know what a squad is, right? Well, listen, squad goals actually comes from the word squadron. You can actually see it right here. Squad, same root word from squadron. And it's a fortified, unified fighting force. It's a military term. Now it's more of an inspirational or even an aspirational term. It's basically like the idea that, oh, these are the ideal group of people I want in my life. And it was actually a term that's been around since 2004, but then Taylor Swift made it popular. Like, all roads lead to Taylor Swift, right? Um, in, her, in her video, Bad Blood, she referred to her friends as my squad goals. These are my besties. These are my fierce fighting force that comes together and we're better together. So that's kind of the idea of a squad. These are the people that come in and kind of make you better than you were before. It's one of the most popular hashtags on social media right now. You go on Twitter or Instagram, you type in squad goals or hashtag squad goals, you're going to find all sorts of things. And in fact, memes come up. And a meme is really like an image that has like, a, uh, like some sort of clever words or phrase on there. Some popular squad goal beams. In fact, I want to show you a couple of them. And here's one. This is actually a throwback from the 90s. Who remembers the show Friends? Oh, wow. Some of you like likes to watch the show. Who had the Rachel haircut in the 90s? Okay. And you still have one. Great. Um, good. Uh, hey. You know, everyone wants, you know, they look at the, the, the cast from Friends, like, man, it'd be great to have a Phoebe in our group, or a Joey, you know, a dumb, cute guy, something like that, you know, or you've got Rachel, or you've got Chandler, you know, it'd be great if we had them all, like, you know, if this, if this was our friendship group, right? Or if it's not in Friends, it's in your superhero. How about the Avengers? Any Avengers fans in the room? Yeah, you know, it was an Infinity War summer, and you know, we, you know, what's great about the Marvel comic movies is you don't, you can go watch, you can watch like, you know, uh, Captain America save the day, or the Hulk save the day in his own movie, or even Black Panther kind of save the day. But what's great is they all come together for the Avengers, and they're actually better together. They fight against the biggest forces of evil in the entire universe, and it's like, oh, like these are great. As individuals, they're strong, but when they come together, they're even stronger. And of course, if we talk about squad goals, we have to talk about the greatest squad goal of all time, and that is the New York Yankees. Any Yankee fans around here? There's a few of you. Okay. You've got the, the new bomb squad with Judge and Stanton and Sanchez, and these guys are breaking records, and they are going to take us to the World Series. Anyone excited about that? Yeah, sorry, Red Sox fans, but, uh, you know, it's just how it is. But this is the idea of a squad. It's these unique individuals that come together and actually make you better when they're together. So let's ask that question again. Who's in your squad? Think about this right now. Who is in your squad? Maybe it's family members that you're thinking of or coworkers or your friendship group. But who's in your squad? Who are the men and women that are making you better, that are actually making you accomplish and fulfill what it is that God has you to do, what he's made you for? Because the truth of the matter is we need men and women in our lives that can do that because we can't do that on our own. In fact, I love how Andy Stanley puts it. Andy Stanley, he says this, you will never reach your full potential without tapping into the wisdom of others. What he's essentially saying is you don't know what you don't know about yourself because you just don't know. You don't have that vantage point. 
That's why we need a diverse group of men and women in our lives. Married, single, uh, men and women, uh, different races, different cultures that can actually look into our life and help maybe see the blind spots that we don't see about ourselves. That can help maybe call some of those things out and see maybe the good things that we don't even, uh, we're not even aware of yet. But they can help us become those better people. In fact, you know, maybe you've experienced this, right? You know, you've, uh, you know, you see this couple and they've got an incredible marriage. Like he is super attentive to his wife and she is just, you know, very loving towards him. And you're just thinking, man, like they've got such an amazing marriage. Like I wish our marriage could be more like that. And one of the things that we do here at Liquid is we have marriage mentoring because what you need in your marriage is you need a mentor. Someone that's further along in life that can maybe pull you into that preferred future that you want to go in. Or, or maybe you've had this happen where someone comes up to you and says, you know, I'm really just struggling my finances. I just can't seem to, to kind of see where all the money goes or how it all fits together. And you say, well, listen, I'm no Dave Ramsey, but you know, hey, I can, I can maybe help you with a budget. Let me bring you under my wing and you can be my apprentice. Or have you ever had friends come to you and they're just really discouraged and they're just having a really rough season? They're like, you know, I'm really just sick of dating. I'm sick of all the losers out there. I seem to find all of them. I just want to give up. And you can come alongside your friends and say, you know, don't give up. You know, God still has a plan for you. He's going to be with you in the midst of this because what they need more from you than anything else is they need a cheerleader. Someone that's got their back that's going to say, hey, listen, let me show you the positives in the midst of some of these negative things. You see, in your squad, you may have lots and lots of different people, but make sure you have one of these three groups of people, or all three of these folks. Make sure you have a mentor, someone that you're apprenticing, and also a cheerleader, someone that you can invest in, and someone investing in you, and someone that you can come alongside with as well. These three type of people will help put you in the fast lane to become who God made you to be. In fact, we're going to look at a squad in the Bible that kind of helps us see, okay, here are the qualities of a quality squad. And this is a group of folks that used to roll with a guy named Paul or the Apostle Paul or Paulie, if you're from the shore, you know, however you want to refer to him. Now, Paul, he rolled pretty deep with all sorts of folks. He had men and women that he would partner with to kind of uh, expand the reach of the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus. But there were two guys he especially hung out with, which were part of his entourage. And that was a guy named Timothy and a guy named Barnabas. And, you know, they're kind of the, the archetypes of what we're looking at when we talk about our squad goals. Do we have these three types of people? Do we have a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas? And so today we're going to talk about how do you pursue a Paul, a mentor, Someone, again, who's further along with you. You see, Paul actually mentored the entire first generation of the church. We would not be here if it weren't for the influence of Paul. We still feel his influence today. But we also need to kind of eventually look at what does it mean to apprentice a Timothy? Now, Paul mentored this kid named Timothy. He was a teenager. He was kind of shy and timid. But by the time, after he'd finished learning from Paul, he was one of the greatest Christian leaders of his generation. And finally, we're going to talk about a lesser-known hero, and it's a guy named Barnabas. Now, not many of us may have heard of Barnabas, but you know what? Without Barnabas, there would really be no expansion of the Christian faith. His role was crucial. We're going to talk about him in the next couple weeks. In your squad, you need to have a Paul, a Timothy, and a Barnabas. You need a mentor, an apprentice, and also a cheerleader. These three types of people are going to help you become who God made you to be. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now. I, I get that. You're like, dude, I don't have any more room for any more people in my life. Right? You're like, I, I don't need any more friends. Like, I, I don't even know what to do with the friends that I have. I wish I didn't have certain family members, but I just, I ain't got no more room. And listen, I get that. And I definitely understand and I sympathize. But let me ask you this. Have you ever tried to make progress in an area of your life? Like you're trying to take that next step, maybe break out of some old habits and patterns. But when you do that, you, you somehow get suck, sucked back right into it? Back into bad habits and bad patterns? See, I, I think that sometimes one of the things that keeps us from moving forward is actually the squad that we're in. You know, there's this principle in social science. It's called the, the law of averages. What the law of averages basically says is that you and I are the composite of the five people we spend the most time with. That we kind of take on the habits and the patterns of the five people we spend the most time with. For some of you, that's either really encouraging or really discouraging. Because if you're trying to kind of make move forward in your life, you want to take better steps or make some better decisions, 
But, you know, you, you kind of look at your life and your friends, it, it, it may be why it's holding you back. Like, you know, you kind of are always going to the same bar you've always gone to for the past 10 years, and you see the same friends in that bar that you've always seen for the past 10 years, and you are still talking about the same things you've always been talking about for the past 10 years, and you're complaining about the same things you've been complaining about for the past 10 years. No wonder you're not making any progress. No wonder you're not making any headway. And really, the issue could be you might need to swap out your squad. You actually might need to swap out your squad to find folks that have the same mindset as you, the same focus as you, the same heart as you. If you want to develop mental toughness and grit, spiritual passion, a heart for God, maybe it's your squad that's holding you back and you might need to swap them out to find the right squad that's going to fit. And you know, Paul is going to show us how do we do that. How do we swap out our squad to get the right one to get us to where we want to go? Which is why we're going to talk about what does it look like to pursue a Paul or to pursue a mentor in our lives? Because if you think of anyone who's accomplished anything big in their lives, you may think, man, what a great leader. What a great leader in finance or industry or education. I guarantee you there is a mentor whose shoulders that they're standing on. I mean, think about Warren Buffett, right? We've all heard of Warren Buffett. He's like a gazillionaire, right? But no one's probably heard of Benjamin Graham. Benjamin Graham mentored Warren Buffett, taught him about investment. And now Warren basically teaches us and so many other people around the world. Or how about Oprah? I mean, Oprah, she doesn't even need a last name. You just say Oprah and everyone knows who she is. But Oprah was mentored by poet laureate Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou taught Oprah the power of words, how words can literally reshape the way we see the world around us and open up new possibilities. So Oprah stands on her shoulders and is able to have the impact because of Maya Angelou. But of course, Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker stands on the shoulders of men like Obi-Wan Kenobi, who, ta- who introduced him to the Force, and of course Yoda, who taught him how to use the Force. You guys see the pattern? There's this pattern between these folks. You've got the older mentor that kind of takes on the younger guy, or younger gal, and helps her become who she, he or she is meant to be, and sometimes there's a little green man in the background too, <laughs> Right? But all of us, you know, if these folks need mentors to invest in their lives, we need the same. We need people, men and women, that will help us get to the next level of who we're called to be. In fact, maybe some of you in here, God is saying, I want you to be that for someone who's younger. A younger man or a younger woman to come alongside of them and help them to be their Paul. So before we jump in and look at more of this, we need to talk about who this guy Paul is. If we're going to talk about how do you pursue a Paul or pursue a mentor. And like I said, Paul kind of mentored the early church, but he also wrote about 28% of the New Testament. He was a church planter. He was a preacher. Uh, he pretty much helped establish a lot of the churches in the Roman Empire at the time. But, you know, before that, Paul had a pretty dark past. Paul was a murderer. He was a killer. He wanted to kill out all the Christians at the time. and He was pretty effective at it until he had an encounter with Jesus that pretty much changed everything. In fact, there's a movie that just came out about the life of the Apostle Paul. It's called Paul, an Apostle of Christ. I want to actually show you a little bit of the trailer so that you can get a taste, a little bit of a flavor of what Paul's life was like. Let's watch. So Paul, after he has this encounter with Jesus, he really just falls in love with Christ and wants to kind of take the gospel all over the world. In fact, when he does this, he starts bringing men and women to go along with him. He starts recruiting a squad. And he'd bring the squad with him wherever he went. And these guys would, and gals would end up being, you know, pastors and leaders of the early church, kind of launching the influence of the church throughout the empire of Rome and even to where it is today. And so, you know, Paul actually kind of talks about what does it mean to be a good mentor. He actually kind of uh, traces these qualities in a letter that he writes to a church in Thessalonica. It's in a letter in the Bible called 1 Thessalonians. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 today. If you have your Liquid Church app, it's great because you have the um, scripture printed in there, or not printed, the scripture's in there, the notes are in there. You can actually follow along if you have the Liquid Church app. Otherwise, you can go ahead and get set up there. And as you're getting set up, I want to give you a little bit of background of what's going on here. Uh, Paul started this church in this city, this, his squad there. And what happened was he had, to, he had to get rushed out of there. And he heard a persecution that was being taken place there. And that they, the, the church that he started, his squad there may be suffering. They were going through a hard time. But he hears actually that they're not only surviving, but they're actually thriving. They're doing really, really well. 
And so he writes this letter to encourage them and also to mentor them and kind of lays out what it looks like to be a mentor to this early generation, but also how we can be mentors and how we can find quality mentors as well. So let's go ahead and start reading verse 7. It says this, Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. So what Paul is doing is he's saying, Hey guys, we have a special relationship. It's tender. Like, I care for you. It's not just a professional thing, but you guys are like family. And he says, Because we loved you so much, we delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So for Paul, he's like, you know, I didn't just come and preach at you or put something on your Facebook page or, you know, you know give you a track. But no, no, we, I lived together with you guys. We, we did life together. Like we had dinner and I played with your kids and we know each other. And he goes on to say, surely remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardships. We worked night and day in order you not to be burdened by anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. So again, Paul's saying, we weren't trying to sell you anything. We're just trying to do life together and show you the hope that we have that we found in Jesus. In fact, you are witnesses, and so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. Again, he's making his case. We weren't trying to be manipulative, but you saw how we lived. It was out front. It was open. It was honest. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father, so again, there's that familial language, deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. See, for Paul, when he cared for his squad, it wasn't a professional thing, but it was profoundly, profoundly personal. He loved these people. These people were his family. They'd become that close to him. And so when we talk about mentoring or how to pursue a Paul, I want to look at three qualities that we see in this passage and how we can know how to see a quality mentor. Or maybe you're here going, man, I really feel like maybe this is what God wants me to do. I need to step in and mentor others. See if these qualities resonate with you. The first quality I want to look at is this, is that good mentors practice candor with compassion. They practice candor with compassion. You know, uh, Paul talks about this idea of compassion, actually, in the first verse where he says this, just as a nursing mother cares for her children. Now, this is really an intimate image of that of a nursing mom. I remember when my wife had our kids, and she was able to nurse them, and for her, it was really, really personal. Because when you see that little baby, that infant, literally, they're completely dependent on you for everything. Food, shelter, protection, everything. They're helpless without you. Paul looked at this church and he said, he said that they were helpless without him. I mean, they had no other influence other than Paul. And so Paul's thinking, I got to help you guys survive. So he would tenderly nurture them and care for them so that they would actually become who God made them to be. And you know, he has this beautiful uh, motherly image, but he balances it also with a fatherly image in verse 11 where he says this, for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, as a father deals with children, as a daddy, there is this closeness that, he, again, Paul is bringing into their relationship. And how does a daddy care for his kids? Well, he does it by encouraging and comforting and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Because, you know, in the ancient world, there was this idea that, you know, moms, they're soft and they're compassionate, but dads are hard and stern. But Paul's like, no, 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 that's not how it is. Dads are encouraging, they're comforting, and they're urging. This idea of urging is this idea of candor. Candor is defined as direct honesty. Just in a, in a way where you can actually tell someone the truth honestly and directly without beating around the bush. That's the idea. And so when Paul talks about compassionate candor, he's saying, I want to tell you the truth, but do it in a context of love where you know that this is where I'm coming from. It's for your best. And so I'm going to tell you something that maybe it's hard to hear. And Paul actually does this in the letter. He's talking to the Thessalonians and he says to them, hey guys, you need to avoid sexual immorality. If you keep going down that road, you're going to experience the judgment of God. And that's like a really tough thing to say. But Paul loved them so much, he didn't want them to stay stuck. So he told them the hard truth, even if it was difficult for them to hear. Because I think most of us, if we're honest, we kind of, we're somewhere in that spectrum between being candid and being compassionate, Right? Some of us are really good at being candid. Like, we'll get in your face. We'll tell you how it is. We'll, we'll speak the truth to you so you can kind of, you know, set things right and get yourself in order, right? But you can kind of, kind of come out as harsh and judgmental. Or you can be really, really compassionate, you know? You, know, you don't want to ruffle feathers. You're like, you know what? 
you're perfect just the way you are. You know, so precious, right? But, you know, that's not loving. No one can really grow. If we can come to this place where we can say, you know what, you're not perfect where you are, but you have room to grow and to develop, that's the sweet spot. That's candor with compassion. When you're uh, looking at your squad, do you have someone that can give you candid feedback, but you know it's in a compassionate way? You know it's, it's, they, it's that they love you. They want your best. And so they're not afraid to give you the unvarnished truth because they know it's going to make you better. And maybe you have those friends of yours that can give that kind of honest feedback, or maybe you've got some family members, or maybe you've got folks at work that you work with that you know will give you the, the truth. And you don't have to worry about whether or not they're trying to say it so they can, you know, impress you or anything like that. You know, uh, Kim Scott in her book Radical Candor tells a story about her friendship with Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, both of them worked at Google for a time. Sheryl was, the, uh, was in charge of online sales at Google. Kim Scott was in charge of operations. Now Sheryl Sandberg's over at Facebook. But Kim Scott was telling this story about how she was giving this presentation to Sheryl Sandberg and some of the folks at Google, and she gave this incredible presentation. She was doing really well. Her department was growing. They were, um, you know, getting new products in. It was going really, really well. And so she gave this presentation, and she killed. People were applauding her. They were so excited about all the different products she was doing. And then Cheryl took her aside and said, Hey, you know, Kim, I would love to kind of talk with you about your presentation. And so they're having a conversation. Cheryl's uh, telling Kim, Hey, great presentation. This was really good. We're excited about all the things that are happening in the company and your department. But then Cheryl gave this feedback to Kim Scott. She said this, um, I did have one thing to say. Uh, every time you were talking, every other word you said was um, and it was really kind of distracting. You know, and Kim heard that, and she's like, well, I'm not a public speaker. That's not really my thing. I lead my department. I'm a leader. That's what I do. That's really what I'm in charge of. I, I don't know. It's not really something I need to, to develop in or, or change and get, and, and get better at. And finally, Cheryl just stops her. She's like, hold on one second. I guess I wasn't being clear enough. Every time you say um, it makes you sound stupid. Whoa, awkward, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, it's so awkward. It's like, and, and if you're Kim Scott, how would you take that? Like, are you attacking me? Are, 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 you, are you talking down on me? Are you judging me? Like, what are you doing here? But what's interesting is the way Kim Scott took that feedback, she says this, she goes, you know, if she didn't say it to me that directly, that candidly, I wouldn't have changed. That was the most loving thing anyone has ever said to me. It was loving because I knew that Cheryl wanted my best, and she knew that sometimes it means that she might have to hurt my feelings. You see, having candor with compassion means that we can have those direct conversations with people, that we can say what needs to be said, even if it's difficult, because they know it's from, coming from a place of love. So look for a mentor that can practice candor with compassion. I mean, maybe, you know, you could have an opportunity to even do this in your, wherever you're serving or in your small group. I mean, how many of you guys know a volunteer, have a volunteer that you serve alongside with, maybe in Guest Connections or Liquid Family? And maybe they're always complaining about their boyfriend. You know, they come in and they're, they're always talking about, oh, you know, he's not in attentive to me. You know, he always blows me off to hang out with my friends. And what you always tell them is, well, I'll be praying for you. <laughs> I'm praying for you. And what, what if you actually did the more spiritual thing and actually would actually practice candor with compassion? And you actually maybe stepped in as a mentor and maybe you took a risk and said, hey, why don't we go hang out at the Clean Water Cafe and you had a cup of coffee or tea. And then you said to them, listen, I notice you're always talking about your boyfriend. Did you ever consider that maybe he may not be the right one for you? And I know like there's a danger in that, right? You don't want to be misinterpreted or see that you're meddling. But, but what if you maybe even leaned into that awkwardness and actually asked the second question, which is, you know, like usually like when you're in a relationship, you know, there's joy, right? Because this is someone that God has brought in your life. Yeah, there's times where it's tough, but there's this sense of joy because, you know, it, you, there's, you, there's that connection. If you're not sensing that joy, I mean, you're feeling, it seems like you're more negative than anything else. Do you think that this is really of God? You see, when if we can ask the right questions, we can still be loving. We can also be candid. We can be direct, we can be honest, and we can really highlight the qualities of a good mentor. So when you're looking for a mentor, practice candor with compassion. Or if you aspire to be a mentor, do you do this right now at work with your coworkers, with your spouse, with your friends? Are you able to be candid with them, even if at times it can be kind of awkward or it can be hurtful? 
That's the first quality of having of being a quality mentor, practicing candor with compassion. The second of a high quality mentor is that they open up their lives. Those kind of mentors open up their lives. You know, one of my favorite verses is actually right here in verse 8. It says this, So we cared for you because we loved you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our what? Lives as well. You see, for Paul, you know, he was sharing who he was with that church. Because you got to understand that at this time period in history, there really was, like, there was no thing called Christianity. Like, Christians were considered these, like, Jews that were in a cult. And so, literally, the, like, when Paul stepped foot in that city, there were, there were no Christians there. He was the only one. And then Paul raised up this squad, and they were the only Christians in that area. And so literally, they had to look at the life of Paul to even understand, what does it even mean to be a Christian? How does a Christian talk? How does a Christian walk? How does a Christian do business? They had to look at Paul to see how all of those things fit together. Paul was their only working model of what it meant to follow Jesus in a pagan world. And so Paul opened up his life to them so they could see how he did it. In fact, he goes on to say this in verse 9. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We worked night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preached the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses. You saw this. And so is God of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. So Paul's saying this, guys, we, we didn't even want to put a burden. We weren't asking you for money to support us. I actually was supporting myself. You know, one of the things that people don't realize about Paul, Paul wasn't just a preacher. Preaching was like his like other job. He had two jobs. He's what's known as bivocational. His other job is he was he was a tent maker. So what he would do is he'd roll into one of these cities, he would set up his tent shop, and he would start, you know, selling people on and, and building tents or repairing tents. He would hire subcontractors out, and these were probably the folks that actually became the first Christ followers. And so literally they're in Paul's shop hanging out with Paul, working with Paul, seeing how Paul works, seeing how Paul does business, seeing how he treats his customers. Oh, he had a really rough time with that customer. But look how he reacted. He had a lot of grace. And literally, that's how they would know how Christians would act, by looking at the life of Paul. Because Paul opened up his life to them. In the same way, when you're looking for a mentor, for, for someone, for a quality, you want to look for someone who's willing to open up their life to you. That they're not willing to kind of give you this, oh yeah, everything is perfect, everything is awesome, just look at me. No, no, they're willing to open up and show you the, the cracks and the not-so-nice stuff because they're willing to be honest and open. You know, my wife and I had this opportunity to do that. A couple years ago, uh, my brother-in-law actually moved in with us. He was uh, working in the area, and he was saving up to get married, and so uh, Bobby was living with us for a little bit, and it was great. Like, we had dinner together, so he saw how we did family dinner. Uh, he saw how we parented our daughter. So he, he kind of got, like, an inside glimpse of how we kind of did marriage before he was about to kind of launch into his own. And while I was doing that, I remember one day, uh, he came home from work, and he walked in the door, and my wife Jackie and I were fighting. Like, and it was a bad fight. Like, like the spit is flying out of each other's mouths, you know what I'm talking about? And, and so he, he, he walks in, he's like, what did I just walk into, right? So, you know, we, we first got married, we're trying to figure out how to do conflict, you know, I was wrong, but I didn't want to admit it, you know, t- that type of thing. And so, literally, this fight is going on, like, we're yelling and screaming, and Bobby's like, I'm just, just gotta go to my room, so he's, he's tiptoeing you know, around us, like we're in the middle of the living room, the stairs are over here, and he's trying to get past us, and I don't know why, but all of a sudden I just looked at him and said, Bobby, I want you to stay here and watch this fight. (laughs) And Bobby's like, what? And he's looking at me like I'm nuts. My wife is looking at me like she's about to divorce me, and and literally, no, no, you need to see us fight because you need to see how how we resolve conflict. And at that point, I wasn't sure how we were going to resolve this, but it seemed like the right thing to do. You know, we're mentoring him, why not? So so he's sitting there watching us fight, and you know, it's up and it's down, we're yelling, and one of us is crying, it's probably me. And so while all this is going on, you know, eventually we get to the root issue, and we work through it, and I apologize because it was my fault, and ask for forgiveness, and we, we, we make amends, and we ended the fight. And it was great. And so, you know, I went over to Bobby, or maybe I waited a couple hours, and I asked, so, uh, what'd you think of that? <laughs> and he's like, that was interesting. <laughs> and so, you know, I asked him, well, I mean, did you learn anything? Like, what did you notice? I'd love to get your, your input. And he's like, well, I thought it was interesting, like, no matter how mad you guys got, you didn't just leave the room. You, you didn't just storm out. But you guys said you guys really loved each other, so you, you said you're going to stick it out until 
you worked it out. I was like, yeah, I mean, that's something that we're committed to. And, and I think that was really interesting that he was able to notice that because that's something that we're striving to do. We don't always do it well, but we wanted to say, hey, you know what? Even though we're married, we have conflict, we have fights, but we want to love each other in the midst of that. And so that I thought was interesting because when you're looking for a mentor, oftentimes you want to find someone that's got all their stuff together, but you really, you don't want someone that's got their stuff together. You want someone who's willing to be open and honest with their life. They're willing to show you the good, the bad, and the ugly because they have nothing to hide. That's a a high-quality mentor. That's what you need to look for in a high-quality mentor. Or if you're striving for that, what you can embody. So I want to do a quick review before we looked at the third quality. The first quality is that mentors practice candor with compassion. They'll tell you the unvarnished truth. And they do it out of love because they want you to win. They want you to grow and develop. You You need a mentor in your life that has that on your squad. They also open up their lives. They're not afraid to show you the mess because life is messy and we don't always have it all together. And the third and final quality we're going to look at in this passage is this, is that mentors are guided by a greater goal. They're guided by a a goal that's further than just kind of what's happening on the surface. In fact, that's what Paul was all guided about. Paul says this, he says that the, the goal is to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. See, that phrase, live lives worthy, some, some translations say to walk worthy, but the idea is that you're going to live in such a way that people are going to look at you and go, you seem different. You seem like you've been with Jesus. You, you, you kind of look like Jesus, smell like Jesus, you act like Jesus. He wanted their outward behavior to match what they actually believed so that there was congruence in their life, that they would have character. And see, for Paul, he was writing to this church, to his squad out there, saying, guys, I don't want you to live like the Romans are living. I don't want you to live like the Thessalonians are living. I actually want you to live as if you're part of the kingdom of God. And then you can bring the kingdom of God values and the kingdom of God ways of living and doing life into the Roman world and show them what grace looks like and love looks like and sacrificial surrender looks like. So that when they look at you, they actually sense there's something different because literally it's like there's Jesus about you. You see, Paul doesn't just want them to be successful or to have lots of money or to have great relationships. All those things are good. He actually wants them to look more like Jesus. He's trying to help them see, guys, there's a greater goal than simply what you're going through right now. There's a greater story that you're a part of than the story that you're in right now. There is a greater perspective that if you tap into that perspective, if you can see things from heaven's perspective, you'll be able to live a life that honors God and finds success here and now. See, what a good mentor does, actually no, what a great mentor does is see how you fit into the bigger story. How your gifts and your talents all fit into that bigger story. In fact, That's what great mentors do. In fact, if you look at the mentors of Steph Curry, that's what they did for him. Some of you guys know who Steph Curry is. He's a basketball player, plays for the Golden State Warriors. I said Golden Gate last service, so I was corrected. Golden State Warriors. And uh, his team beat LeBron. They beat King James. Can you believe that, right? The great one themselves. And so he is one of their all-star players. And you would think a guy like Steph Curry, like what would his like squad goals be, right? To, to break the three-point record? Is his squad goal to be the greatest of all time? Is his squad goal to, to get in the Hall of Fame? If he asked Steph Curry, I'm sure he'd say, well, those things are nice, but th- that's not my greater goal. I've got a greater goal, a God-sized goal that motivates me. In fact, why don't we hear him say it in his own words? Let's watch. If you've ever seen Steph Curry play, he does this like, you know, And I think for the longest time, I'm like, oh, yeah, he's number one. Like, I got a basket in. I'm number one, right? (laughs) Like, that's the most obvious thing. It's all about him. But when you hear that story, you're like, no, no, this this reminds me that my heart's for Jesus. And then when I point up, this is what I play for. It's for his glory. It's for his honor, for his recognition. Because I'm part of a bigger story. I'm part of a bigger goal. And this was something that wasn't just instilled from his family. He actually had phenomenal mentors that would speak that into his life. In fact, here's what he says about his high school coach, Sean Brown. He says that Coach Sean set the vision for what I could accomplish going forward in what? Life, not just basketball. 
You see, I'm sure Coach Sean was like, you know what? I would, I would love it if you'd be a great basketball player and play in the NBA. That's awesome. But, you know, that's not the greatest goal. You know what the greatest goal would be? That you have a heart for God. That your heart is tender and you can hear his voice and you can sense what he wants to do in your life. You know what the greater goal is? That you become an amazing dad. That you don't sell your kids out for the sport. That you love your kids and that you're an amazing husband. That's the greater goal. That's the greater win. And you see, I think good mentors, no, no, sorry, great mentors get that. You may go to a mentor and be like, you know, I want to I get coached in this skill or I want to get better in this area of my life. But they help you see how all of those pieces are being part of the bigger story that God is telling and that God is weaving together about your life. They can see that. They can call it out and help you find where it fits. So that's what it looks like. Let's review real quick the qualities of a great mentor. Great mentors practice candor with compassion. Get this guy on your squad, someone who's going to tell you the truth, even if it's difficult. They also open up their lives. They're not afraid to show you the good, the bad, the ugly. They, 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 they want to show you it so they can teach you how you can live a life of intentional living. And then also, they're guided by a greater goal. They're not afraid to help you see the bigger picture. They're not there just to kind of, so you can kind of get stuck in simply this or that, but how can you see the bigger picture of what God has made you to be and what you're called to do? So I want to kind of close our time with this last question, which is this. How do you find a mentor? How do you pursue a Paul or a mentor who's in your life that can help you get to that next level? Well, in many ways, I really think that there are mentors all around us, but we don't recognize it. In our own social networks, in our own groups, Literally, God has placed those people, but sometimes when we're not looking for them, we miss them. Because when it comes to kind of pursuing a Paul, it's just that there's a pursuit aspect of it. There's a sense where it's on us. We need to be able to have the awareness to see and have the courage to ask people to step in. But first, it kind of comes to the place where we need to ask ourselves, where, where do we want to grow? Where do I want to be mentored in? Where do I want to get to that next level? Maybe you're here today and you're wrapping up high school or college. You're kind of finishing up that season and you're kind of wondering, okay, what's, what's my next step? Is my next step to, to find something that's going to fuel my passion, that I'm in love, that's going to make me fired up? Or is it, well, I just got to get a paycheck. I got to pay the bills. I got to be practical. And you're kind of wrestling with that tension, and you're not sure what to do. You're hearing one thing, and you're hearing another thing. You know there's people in this very church that have wrestled with the same thing that you're wrestling with? that have some perspective that they can share with you and help you understand maybe some different ways to see things. The very people that you may be sitting next to could actually help mentor you in what you need to do next. Or maybe you're a small business owner you're, or you're just starting your, a business, you're an entrepreneur, you love taking risks, and you're like, Nathan, I don't have time for people. Like, I don't need to know anything else. I've been on YouTube and there's lots of instructions how to start a business on YouTube. Okay, <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Do you know what it feels like? Do you know what it feels like to quit your job with a small family and take all of your savings and go all in on a business where if it fails, you're finished? If you make it or if you don't make it, you don't eat. Where is YouTube when that happens? But you know, there's men and women that you're sitting next to who have experienced that themselves. They started businesses. Some businesses have failed. Some of them have started and failed several businesses. They would love to come alongside you and help you know, here's what you do when the fear hits. Here, here's some things that I learned from my failure. Here, let me show you some things that you can try. Let me introduce you to some people. See, there's people that would love to help you succeed and even give you some extra tools that you're probably serving alongside with in Liquid Family or Guest Connections or on Roadies or Clean Water Cafe that would love to help you get there. Or maybe it's in parenting, right? Maybe some of you are new parents or you're going to be a new parent very soon. You know, and, and you, you get to the hospital and they hand that baby and then they're about to check you out and you're like, wait, you're going to let me leave with it? <laughs> like, 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 you know, I needed a license to drive a car. Do we need a license? Like, how, how, how does this work? What do, what do I do with this thing, Right? And then you get home, and it's just nonstop exhaustion. 
crying and they won't stop crying and feeding and, and, and constantly, you know, it, 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 they can't tell you anything. They just poop and cry. It's, it's all they do. And just the exhaustion and this, the, just the tiredness, it kind of runs you down. You know, there's parents, moms and dads who've gone through what you've gone through, who would love to come alongside of you, maybe help out with a meal and encourage you. Hey, listen, you're going to get through this. This won't last forever. Just keep going. And they can continue to continually be a resource to you. And, you know, as your kid gets older and they're hitting the terrible twos or threes and you're like, you know, they had a meltdown in the supermarket. I didn't know what to do. How did you handle that? What did you do when your kids did that? I just gave them the candy because it shut them up. Like, is that okay? <laughs> right? Is that all right? Or maybe you're here today. Someone invited you here. Maybe they said, hey, why don't you, why don't you come out to brunch? And they brought you to church instead. So you're probably mad at them. Right? <laughs> But you, you're struggling with real doubt. You're like, I don't know if I believe in this Jesus stuff. Like, you know, I don't even know if I believe in God, right? But, and there's so many other religions and there's all these competing claims. How do I know what's true and what's not true? You've got real doubts and you've got real questions. Do you know that we've got people in this church who've had those same doubts? Not only have they had those same doubts, they've actually walked away from faith, wanting nothing to do with it. Maybe wanting nothing to do with Christians. But then something happened on their journey where they actually came back and now they're invested in church. They're, they're, they're connected with Jesus and their faith is stronger than ever. I'm sure they would love to talk with you and hear your story. Maybe even give you perspective of what they learned on their own journey and how they came to the answers that they came to. Guys, we have a community of 4,000 people all across our campuses We've got uh, business owners and we've got artists. We've got moms and we've got seniors. We've got dads. We've got grandparents. We've got all these different kinds of people with all these different kinds of experiences have gone through so many things that would love to share the wealth of their knowledge and their experience so that they can help you go forward in the preferred future that you want. But to add them on your squad, all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is ask. Maybe you'll see someone's truck in the parking lot that's got their business on it. You're like, man, there's a business owner. I could, I'd love to learn from them. And maybe pick their brain on that. So here's where I want to end. Because I really do believe that God has given us those people in our lives. We just need to have our eyes open so that we have awareness. You would be serving along with them every month or every week. Whether it's on one of the teams like the Guest Connections or the Liquid Family Team. And maybe it's time that you need to ask them to take that risk. So in a moment, I'm going to pray that God actually opens the eyes of our hearts so we can see those mentors in our midst and we can ask. And maybe if you're here today, you're like, I know I'm supposed to be the mentor. That God would open your eyes to see who you need to make that investment in. Let me pray for you. Jesus, Lord, I feel like there's so many lies in our culture. Some of us have believed the lie that says we're too old to have any impact on anyone, to have an impact on the next generation. Some of us believe that we failed too badly. Some of us have believed that we're just too far gone. But Lord, you are raising up a generation of men and women who will stand up and say, I'm going to be a Paul. I'm going to be a Paul. I am going to be a Paul in someone's life. And so, God, I pray right now that you just begin to put that in the hearts of men and women, that they would be a Paul in someone's life. And, Lord, there are people here that are looking for mentors. They're craving for people to invest in them. God, I pray, Lord, that you just make them aware of those people. Some of them are in their families. Some of them are, are serving alongside of those people. And some of them may not even have met them yet, God. But would you bring those people together, God, in the next couple of weeks? That this summer they'd have a mentor that helped take them to their next level. God, I pray, Lord, that as we go forth from this place, you would help us become who you have called us to be and made us to be. In your son's mighty and awesome name we pray. Amen.